How did everybody jump here? And in this video, in about, I don't know how long it's gonna be, it might be 20, might be 30, might be 40 minutes or less, um, we are going to do another session of driving with Jonathan. And I'm really excited to have this trainer with me. Um, everybody can say hello to Schubert. Um, say hi everybody, Schub. What's up, people? Um, me and Schubert, it's 2018. So we go back like... Too long. We go back... <laughs> 2004, 2005, so like, whew, yeah, too long. <laughs> I'm afraid to do the math. Like 13 years, like 13, 14 years, something yeah. like that. So, um, and you guys have to know, like, it's it's really a case of if there's no Schubert, guarantee this whole Jonathan thing does not happen. So you have to understand, this is like Mr. Miyagi over <laughs> here, Daniel Son over here, Big Brother over here, Little Brother over here, like. There are so many aspects um, of training and professionalism that I didn't get um, until like Schubert mentored me. So now you're going to be able to meet the person who mentored me into the person that can now mentor you. And I know that he has a lot of information. So Schub, thanks for uh, for coming in. No doubt. Um, glad to have you. And uh, let's um let me let me jump a little bit and I'm going to jump backwards. Well, first of all, the number one goal of driving with Jonathan is to make sure that we get you information without killing you. So we're going to keep yeah, you Yeah, I appreciate right? that. You're taking the family to Disney World in a couple weeks. Yeah, so I'd appreciate you that, you know. All right, so here's the thing about Schubert. Like, we um, we met up at uh, at Signature, no, at, at Powerhouse Gym, all right? And it's funny because I think that we only really connected because we were two trainers that kind of pushed the limits in terms of training where like I think Schubert um, pushed the limits as a trainer and I think I pushed the limits in terms of operations because we had very outdated operations um, but I even remember the book yeah the book I remember the book <laughs> a flip reading. book like we used to sell personal training sessions using a flip book and I was like this is stupid let's get more dynamic let's let's make videos and then people didn't want to hear it you know, well, the head trainer didn't want to hear. And it took a lot, you know, for us to, like, really put our minds together. And um, honestly, Shub, in the beginning, I used to hate on you quite a bit. Because, really? yeah, because I remember when I first started, I only used the gym equipment. I would use the machines, and I would use the dumbbells. And I remember you had this big-ass double bag that you used to bring with you, and you had ladders in there, you had ropes in there, you had, like, kettlebells in there. I was like, who is this? Who's, who's this super trainer <laughs> here trying to impress people? I ain't impressed with this shit. I, was, you know, I wasn't willing to learn. I just wanted to do, you know, the little bit that I had learned from Craig. Do you remember Craig? The yeah, I remember Craig. Yeah, he had a very, like, one way to do things, you know. So um, it wasn't until, like, we started talking after the personal training meetings. And we were like, how come they're trying to, like, hold us back? And we really started to vibe. And it's been the same ever since. And then Schubert guided me along in terms of like how to be a better professional, how to be more confident in myself, because that was something I struggled with. I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, Schub, let's uh, let's start with you and your story. Um, how did you start your fitness career? How did you get into fitness? Um, well, that's a long story, but simply put, towards my final few years of college, I was kind of in a place of like, I'm not exactly sure what I want to do with my life, uh -huh. you know, and the place I used to go outside of college was always the gym. It's like, you know, I'd be at the YMCA, I'd be at the boxing gym, you know, it was like my, my sanctuary, if you will, my little happy place. Right. And, you know, people used to see me there and always ask me for help with this, ask for help with that. And I was always glad to help whoever I could, you know. And um, I remember when I kind of came up to this dilemma of like, OK, I have no idea where I want to take my life after college and everything. And I had a family member I was talking about it with and he was a trainer at the time um, back um, in my hometown of Brooklyn. And he was like, well, why don't you consider doing training? You know, you love to be in the gym and you like working with people. And I said, uh, well, maybe I'll look into it. So I took a look into it and. I said, all right, let me try this out. He told me where to get certified. And I went and did my first certification. And I loved it because it was a great program. It was with AFA at the time. And it was a weekend 
certification where basically you went and spent basically three days, eight hours a day in these long classes. And But we had a great instructor who was a physical therapist who gave us not just stuff that was textbook, but stuff that was real world. And she gave us other applications and things that we can use in training as far as, far as like PNF stretching, as far as um, finding out heart rates. And I mean, it was, it was, it was a great seminar. It now, was a great weekend. Question, was there a book involved? Cause I think, Affa, I'm not sure if AFA does live certifications anymore. Um, well, yeah, there was a booklet involved. There was a, a pamphlet that was maybe, I want to say maybe a hundred pages, maybe 150 pages. It wasn't really thick. It was like a workbook. Okay. It wasn't like a textbook per se, okay. you know, but it would, it had all the information you needed. Okay. So like it would go over the skeletal system. It would go over the muscular system. It gave you, you know, all the major parts. It wouldn't go really detailed into, you know, the, the, the tiny microscopic parts of, um, anatomy like you would get like out of an NCA or out of NASM, you know, right. but it was sure a really good foundation. Anyway. Yeah, you rarely ever use that. You know, you rarely ever use it. Honestly, you only use it. I, I, I mostly use that when I'm actually talking to my clients that are doctors. Right. I you know? a, man, I've, I had this chiropractor who used to test me. Like, he was in signature. He used to test me all the time. And that's the only time it came up. Like, you, you do have to understand the general Absolutely. You know, uh, muscular system. But in terms of, like, how muscles work and they're like uh what was that called like the um the, the sliding filament theory like that never comes up no in training so trainers freak out about that all the time like you know you're gonna get you know the client that comes up to you and say how do i get rid of this floppy arm thing yeah. you know they're not gonna ask you about the acronym process you know they're right. not gonna ask you about you know where's the bicipital groove they're not gonna ask you that question right. you know now if you're talking to a doctor and you know they know their stuff and you start you know uh, start using that type of terminology. Uh -huh. They take you a little bit more serious as a trainer. They right. don't just think you're a meathead. They take you more as a technician or a professional. Right. So that in that case, when you're working with that type of clientele, which I have quite a few doctors I work with, pediatricians, uh, gynecologists, radiologists, you know, so forth and so on, they take you a lot more seriously as a professional. Right, right. And is the AFA cert the only cert that you got, or did you get? other certs after that no after AFA, that was just like the foundation that you know uh, once i really got serious about training I, I was just hooked i wanted to learn everything i could possibly learn about training so after AFA, uh one of the major gyms that i worked at was new york sports club and new york sports club for you to get paid on certain levels you had to have certain certifications so one certification you had to have as a new york sports club trainer was nasm okay. national uh, national academy of sports medicine at the time it was called the OPT, which is the um, Optimum Performance Training yeah. System. And it was a, at the time, the textbook was a, was a binder. That binder was at least three inches thick. Right. right? It was huge. All right. And you had to know uh, at least 80 to 85 percent of this in order for you to pass the test. So you had to know your stuff. And it was great because I had a great team of trainers I was working with that would help me study and everything. And we would always bounce ideas off of each other and work with it, each other. When we had downtime, we would come up with what we called the EOD, the exercise of the day. Like how could we make something more dynamic or how could we make, you know, using principles from NASM. So that made you a better trainer. And, you know, that was the next certification I got. So you had a good team around you. I had a great team around me. You it's know, great when I, you have like other trainers that are like with you that want to learn because sometimes in gyms it's very cutthroat or trainers are just in and out. They don't go, they honestly, don't I, I believe that's because of the leadership because we had a great um, uh, um, we had a great FPM, a fitness program manager um, by the name of John Baruch. I mean, uh -huh. this guy was awesome. Like he not only, you know, made sure his team did well. In the sense of like, you know, um, as far as education, because he would make sure that we all knew what we had to know. But he also helped you with sales. So he would reach out to your clients for you when we had to hit our numbers and stuff. And, you were, you know, if, if you weren't great with sales, John would call your client up. It's like, hey, you train with such and such. Right. Well, we have a special package going on. Da, 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 da. You know, even if your, your client weren't done with their block sessions, he would, you know, have your back and he would, you know, sell for you. And and if you hit your numbers, John, you know, would always reward you by like, you know, every 
so often, you know, we he would break out the um, catalog of training equipment and say, okay, we got a budget of this, that, and the other. What do you guys want right. in the gym? And we would get whatever toys we wanted in the gym. You I know, wish there were more of those. Like he was, he was awesome with that. Yeah. Like, like John was really passionate about training. Still is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, he definitely still is. He's a really great guy. Um, okay. But so, so, the, at, so after the NASM. After the NASM. Um, I got certified um, with ISCA, okay. um, which was the certification, well, the boxing certification. Okay. Now, I've been boxing since I was about 15, okay. right? but the whole thing was, in order, for you, in order for you to do teach boxing at New York Sports Club, which that's another story that actually include, happened with John, where I was training a client. And the person who was supposed to teach a, a boxing class at the time didn't show up okay. to the gym and they needed somebody to teach a class. It was one of the most popular classes they had. And John knew that I knew boxing. And in the middle of me training client, he comes over to me and says, shoot, could you teach a boxing class? I'm like, teach a class, like a group class? Like, I don't do group class. He's like, Bro. yeah, he's like, dude, you know, um, all you got to do is like put together a circuit and do some mitt work. And I said, uh, okay, I I'll try it out. I don't know exactly how or, or what came over me, but put on some music, went into like full on, just like, all right, jump jacks, burpees, you know, mountain climbers, just full on military, you know, style boot camp mode. And it, People loved it. They absolutely loved it. And from then on, I became the boxing instructor at New York Sports Club. You know, you know? What's, you know what's funny? It's like I've done, this is my third edition of Driving with Jonathan, right? Right. Every trainer has the same story about group where they did not ever intend to teach it. It was not my intention it at was all. Always personal training. Yep. And I like for me, uh, I think, as you know, when you started doing hand camp, I was intimidated to teach group. Right. Like, I was scared out of my mind. And uh, one of the things also that I noticed about you, a reason why I was hating on you when we were at, when we were first meeting in um, Powerhouse, was that you taught classes and you always had the most popular classes, you know? So it wasn't, I guess, as hard for you to get clients because everybody knew you. Right. You know, but it, it took a situation of you having to be thrown into group and I tell trainers all the time like if you want to be successful one of the main things that you should learn to leverage is group training like don't be afraid of it just because you get a personal training certification that doesn't mean that you can only do one on one now gyms may gyms right. may say that oh well we want this group cert or whatever but like you should try to teach some kind of group class because that's a great way to get in front of a lot of people that might not otherwise meet with you. Well, I'll put it like this. Like, you know, honestly, that was probably a huge, um, I want to say, springboard into my career because the fact of it wasn't something I was planning on, something I wasn't comfortable with, but it, it definitely exploded everything I did to the next level. Right. You know, because that's kind of somewhat similar to the way how I end up teaching classes at Powerhouse. I was I only applied there to be a trainer. And I, you know, got the job as a trainer. And at the time, I, you know, I was one of the only trainers that had an NAS, NASM and, you know, and so forth and so on. And one day the manager says, well, we want to get group classes going. Can any one of the trainers teach a group class? And the Craig, who was, you know, one that was the head trainer at the time, said, why don't you try Schubert? He knows he's he's well. <laughs> So he just threw me to the wolves. Just like, it's like, I didn't, oh, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for this, right, right. you know? So once again, you know, I got thrown into the oven and, you know, came out with cake, you know, whatever you want to call it. Now, this is something, Schubert has always been like way ahead of the game in, in ways that, uh, you know, you just generally don't see like group paid training, you know, aside from the group X training was not a normal thing that I saw in gyms. And, um, well, you did hit camp before we did Double Trouble, right? With yep. Daryl. Yep. All right. So, so take me through the pro your, your mindset. Like, you know you have a, a good class. What inspired you to make a paid group training class within the gym? So, 
the thing was that when I was teaching class, a lot of people kept saying, oh, you know, I would really want to train with you one on one because people always ask me questions about, you know, how could he lose this? How could he do that? This, that, and the other. And, you know, of course, I had a full schedule of clients already. And then I was teaching like a spin class, boxing class, uh, circuit training class. You know, and people would say to me like, oh, I wish I could, you know, train with you one on one, but I can't afford it. Right. You know, it's above, you know, it's above their pay grade, if you will. You know, so the whole thing is, you know, I, I, the idea for Hit Camp was a way to help a lot of people at one time. Mm -hmm. How can we take personal training and multiply it by 10, 20, 50, 100? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where the idea of the camp came from. So the best clients, the best um, results I got out of a lot of clients was by doing Hit with them. You know, high intensity interval training where like what their cardio would be intensive. The the weight training would be, you know, short, quick burst and so forth and so on. And let me cut you off. You were you were doing hit before hit was a big thing. Yeah. You way before I mean? it got popular. Way before it was in the mainstream. He was calling it. I was like, what is this high intensity? It, like you were way ahead of the game and um, and you got good results from it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so. You you were still teaching group X classes, right? While while you were running the hit camp, how did you differentiate? You know what what is going to make somebody say, yeah, I take your group X class, but I'm also going to want to pay for this group class. How did you give more value? What was the difference between the two? Well, pretty much the difference between the two, um, one was the fact that the group X is it's general it's general fitness, right? All right. So when you're doing general fitness, there's no specific goal other than to have a workout, break a sweat. You know, I, just like to, to this day where I still do camp and I tell people, if you come to my gym and you take my boxing class, it's one price because it's just a general boxing class workout. Right. You're but the people stuff well and blah, blah, blah. There you go. But in the morning, when people come to my boot camp in the morning, it's a completely different objective. It's a program. Then they understand it's not just a class. A class you're just coming in is just a random, you know, general fitness, right. you know, workout. That's it. So there's a difference. There's definitely a difference. Okay. Now, I remember some of the Roblox that you got when you were taking it outdoors. But did you have uh, any pushback from the gym when you were teaching the hit camp inside the gym? No, not at all. Because the whole thing is when I originally approached the gym with the idea, I, at the time, I was in two different departments. I was in Group X and I was also in personal training. Right. So I had to, you know, um, I had to kind of bring it up to, to the head trainer, the personal training director at the time, um, Taryn Ash. And then I had to bring it to the general manager, you know, Greg. Right. And I brought them down. To, uh, you know, I had a meeting with them in the office. I said, listen, I've got this idea. It's going to work out for both the gym and work out for personal training. How about we do this, you know, for the, those that can't afford personal training, how about we make a personal training group X type of program? And I explained, just like I just explained to you, how this worked. And they loved it. Right. You know, they loved it. And from then, they just, they set up a poster by the front desk you know, saying times, date, how much would, how much what the cost was. And they said it was, you know, then they, you know, made sure that they put me on the poster so everyone knew who was training and teaching it. And it sold like, you know, crazy. Okay. You know, it, it, it did very, very well. And people really enjoyed it. Okay, so then you're, you're successful there, right? Right. And then you hit that point when you realize, wait a minute, I don't need you. Like you're just taking a percentage off of my hit camp because I'm inside of your space. I'm going to do this on my own. Well, it's kind of tricky. So the whole thing was there was a certain point where I got I was getting paid in the gym. And, you know, um, there was a point where it came up to a cap where they just could not, you know, there was, it wasn't productive for the gym to pay me anymore because, like, you know, the split just wasn't worth it for them. You know? I don't get it. Well, the whole thing was, is that at the time, training, let's say training was 20 bucks per session, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's just use that as a general number. Mm -hmm. The average trainer was getting $10, let's say, right. per session. So it's like a 50-50 split. Right. So then the thing was, with my certifications and my background and everything, I would go to the gym and renegotiate my pay each year right so the whole thing is it, it got to one year where it was like i was getting you know out the 20 bucks i was getting 17 
Right. So the gym was like, there's no profit in it for him. Right. So at this point, they said, how about this? Um, the general manager sat down and he said, how about you become an independent contractor, get your own, you know, name, title, this, that, and the other, and we'll um, basically say, you'll pay us one flat fee of rent to the gym, mm-hmm. you know, and um, you'll pay one flat fee of whatever rent to the make, gym, and whatever you make, you make. Okay. Your win, your losses, so forth and so on. Right. I said, hell, sounds like a good idea to me, you know, and, you know, my company was, was, was born from there. Right. So then why'd you leave the gym? So the whole thing was, is that with Hit Camp, it was originally a 50-50 split with me and the gym. Right. Now, the whole thing is I wanted to take it to the next level because the whole thing was there was, you know, the the aerobics room had a capacity to it. Right. And the fact of there were things I wanted to do that I could not do within the gym. Right. Like I was always, I always loved doing stuff outdoors with people. Mm -hmm. There was a time when, you know... I um, taught a three-hour spin um, spinathon. I remember that outside of the gym, I and that. I brought you know all eighteen of the spin bikes myself from the second floor spin room down the back stairwell onto the sidewalk in front of the gym. Right. All right. It was an awesome class. It was great. Everyone loved it. People talked about. It. There were people on the streets honking as they drove by. People actually stopped and signed up to the gym that day. All right. So you know? one more thing. Um. You can't, number one, you can't be afraid to renegotiate with the gym. The gym doesn't own you, all right? No. Every trainer is an, is an entrepreneur and an independent contractor just by nature. You know, you may Absolutely. just happen to work underneath the gym. So you have the right to go in and say, hey, this is what I bring to the table. And, you know, this is how we're going to, this is how I want to move forward. Yeah, if you're bringing value and, you know, like you're a team player. Right. And any team player, whether you're, if you know anything about football, or basketball, they're going to renegotiate their contract once their value goes up. Right. You know, Michael Jordan is not going to, you know, come to the table and get paid what he got paid when he first came in as <laughs> as a rookie. He's not going to get know? paid the same as, as John Paxson. Exactly. You know, you know what I mean? That might like, be taking it back too far for some You know, but the whole whatever. thing. All right. LeBron's. Yeah. You know, LeBron's, you know, it, it, when any team LeBron's goes to, he's like, listen, y'all know, you, you know what I'm working with. Right. So you can't pay me, you know, what you paid the rookie. Right. You know what I mean? So that's the thing. It's the fact of as long as you're bringing value to the company, they're going to pay you for it. And, any, and the whole thing is just like any other job or any other, you know, um, any other occupation. People renegotiate their pay and stuff, and trainers should do the same thing. Right, right. You know, as long as you know that you're bringing in the numbers. Right. So you have to bring in the numbers. Absolutely. Um, so an- another thing you want? No, go ahead. So going back to you know, because I didn't want to get off the subject too much. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole thing is with hit camp. I wanted to be a little bit more dynamic. I went to the gym and I said, "Listen, I want to be more dynamic." There's a park right across the street. With a huge football field, a soccer field, I apologize. And I think we can take this to the next level. We can put sleds in there. We could flip tires out there. We could do um, ropes out there. We could do sprints out there. We could do so much more out there that we can't do inside the gym. The gym owners said, no, too much liability and this, that, and the other. We don't want to, you know, go into that because they, you know, they were afraid to step out of their box. Right. You know, their box gym. <laughs> right. And I said, OK, well, fine. I said, I'll do it myself. Wow. You know. Wow. So, OK, you presented it to them. They didn't want to roll with you, even though you had an idea in your head. Right. And you said, fine, I'm just going to go no matter what. You can't be afraid in this game if you're going to if you're going to be successful. You know, you if you have a passion, you got to go for it. Yeah. You know, and it turned out well. So you're, you're running the hit camps outdoors. Everything's going well. Yeah. So hit camp started off with somewhere around 15 people outdoors. Then it grew from 15 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to one day. We had a camp so huge. It was roughly 123 people or 24 people. At once. At, all at once out there. Like the field was full to so, capacity at this point now here's the thing jim had already said all right we don't want any part of this if you're going to do this on your own that's all on you but i'm guessing greg or ray or whomever looks outside of their window and all they see is dollar signs all over the place so, yeah one of the owners you know 
I won't say his name because I just don't want to credit him that sure. much. But it wasn't Greg, but it was one of the owners and his wife saw the numbers <laughs> that I was, you know, <laughs> doing out there. And, you know, they they got butt hurt, you know, like, how dare you be successful without us, you right. know? And then sometimes it's what gyms are like, well, yeah, keep going. So the whole thing is, you know, one day they come to me and say, uh, listen, you, you know, you took hit camp and you went out, out with it. And I'm like, yeah, it was my idea, my concept. I came to you guys and you wanted nothing, you know, you didn't want anything to do with it. It's not, you know, you don't, you didn't copyright it. You didn't, you know, you didn't, um, um, trademark it or anything. It's, it's didn't mine. Invest in it you know, you didn't invest in it. So I took my idea and I went out with it, you know, mm -hmm. and basically this is when it got ugly. So they said, well, don't you feel that you, you know, you owe us, you know, for, for that success since people are that go to our gym are going there. I'm like, no, actually, I don't owe you any success from it because one, a good, I would say about 70% of people that were coming to hate camp didn't even go to the gym. Right. All right. They didn't even go to the gym. Was they, they would either drive by and see all these people in the park or, I mean, or like some of them were cops that were in, you know that were involved that they heard about it or they saw it or this that and the other you know so and you know word of mouth grows when you're doing something that nobody's seen before right. everybody wants in on it right you know and like i said like you said before hit camp wasn't something that you saw before you know it, you didn't see people in the tire i mean in the tire <laughs> you didn't see people in a park flipping tires right. that wasn't the typical thing now it is right you know you didn't see people like i remember at the time, I was using whatever tools I can get my hands on at the time, where it was like we were we were carrying um, uh, jugs of cat litter, you know. Yeah. We were. Um, like a farmers carry. Yeah, for farmers carries and stuff, you know, we, we were using um, jugs of cat litter for distance, you know, doing farmers carry. We were using sandbags. We were using chains, you know, just stuff you would find at Home Depot. I mean, I don't think. I think I might have used, might have spent somewhere around a hundred to two hundred dollars on the stuff that I had. Right. I mean, tire, the used tires. I got those free. All right, from a, a used tire spot. They were just flat tires that you know had a hole in them, didn't work anymore. Yeah. So he was gonna chuck them anyway. So you know, and he gave me these big eighteen wheeler truck tires that you know he wasn't using. So those became our flipping tires. You know, like I said, the the kit. The kitty litter that we use for farmers carry cost nothing. Uh, cost not, nothing chains from home depot bags of sand from home depot cost about three four bucks for a 25 30 40 pound bag of sand and you know what i think like it's it's a case where even though it's not as uncommon nowadays if you have the willingness and the passion to put yourself out there because no matter what it's still hard work that's why a lot of the trainers don't want to do it right you know i mean if you're willing to put yourself out there People are looking to, the gym isn't the be all end all of fitness. You know right. what I mean? Like people will want to try something new, you know? That's why they have a, a brand new thing thingamajig coming out every six months. All on, the time. You know, on the uh, infomercials. Because people want to do something new. So if you're willing to try something new and then you captivate your audience, they'll follow you as you come up with new ideas. You're not going to run out of ideas, you know? Um, a lot of times clients contribute ideas that you can kind of like work with vibe with it you know if the idea is kind of dumb you can make it work you know so you um you have to be willing to put yourself out there even with the uh the three hour spinathon right that's just thinking outside of the box right there was such a time where like there was a culture in our gym I remember I was a huge part of it where like if you weren't training you were just sitting inside the office killing time right eating you know, uh, mobile phones weren't that big back then, but like you were just dicking around, not not accomplishing anything. Right. And then I remember, do you remember that the bench press contest? Oh, the did? bench press contest. That was fun. Yeah, I came up with a, an idea. I was like, uh, to the head trainer, I was like, we're gonna come up with a bench press contest. So, you know, I was telling people about it. Something uh, for the meatheads. Something for the meatheads. Some just get like word. You get some going attention to the gym. going. Yeah. And then. Um, you know, I had set a date for it, and I remember we got to the date. The trophies were coming, and then the sign-up sheet had, like, one name on it, right? And Taryn <laughs> started laughing. He's like, you got all these trophies. Ain't nobody going to do your fucking bench press contest. Yep. I was like, we're going to do it anyway. So I got, I started getting, like, um, 
that, that yellow and black tape, that hazard tape. Right. I benched off all, I, I, you know, separated all the benches. I told the girls at the front desk, I was like, I want every 15 minutes, I want you to say that the bench press contest has happened. Long story short, turned out well. We had a good turnout. More people showed up than we expected. But just like the three hour um, spin a thon, it's because you do something different. Right. And because you stick to it and you can't be afraid to just like, to make it happen. You know, sink or swim. I've had a number of bad ideas that didn't work out. But right. the good ideas, when they work, they work big. So, you know, no risk, no reward. You got to try it, you know? Everything's a gamble. Yeah. I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, it's all a gamble, 100%. I mean, you can't be afraid to fail. No. You know, you can't be afraid to fail. You're going to fall. You're going to trip, you know, and you, put, you dust yourself off. You learn. You, you do better. That's just what it is. That's all, you know? Um, so, like, you got the hit camp going. Um, I guess straw that broke the camel's back. You're done with Powerhouse. Mm -hmm. So then you decide, all right, I'm going to get a studio. Right. All right. So then you get your first studio in Montclair. Mm -hmm. um, and then how did that go? How did that go for you? Um, the first studio that I got was outside of the town that I was working. So I was working in Bloomfield at first okay. when, when I was at Powerhouse at the gym because that's where it was. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to get a studio in a little bit more of an affluential area, you know, that I lived in, happened to live in, which was Montclair. Right. You know, the thing is, is that it was a little bit of a flooded area. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a little bit of a flooded area because literally from my studio within walking distance, like less than a, you know, less than a quarter mile in any direction, there was a, a training studio. There was a, a there was a studio, Jersey Pilates. Fitness. There was there was Jersey uh, not Jersey Fitness, um, New Jersey Fitness Factory up the street from me. That was yeah. a walk away. There was a D Fit a walk away from me. Around the corner from me was, you know, I mean, like it was just it was it was it was wasn't exactly the best location. Right. So, but the whole thing is, I had good clientele and I had you know a lot of good references, uh, referrals. You know, so it, it worked out, but not to the best that it could have worked out. Okay, you so know, is that what? Um Propelled you to go to the other location? Yeah, that's pr basically what propelled me to go to the next location. That and the fact that my original location, because it was the first place I was starting out with, and I didn't want to go too big, uh -huh. you know, go above my, go over my head. So it was about 400 square feet, mm -hmm. you know, of space, which was a decent amount of space for uh, strictly personal training. Mm -hmm. Like I did a few group sessions, but the group sessions was like three and four. Right. It wasn't like, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 or any double digits. Yeah. You know, um, it worked out. All right. It was a really nice place and everything. Um, the rent was a bit high because of where it was. So then I decided, you know what? I need a bigger space. I need, I need more ability to do more things. So I moved, I found a space back in Bloomfield, not not too far from where I used to work at Powerhouse, and that space was a thousand square feet. It was you know it's a where it was a warehouse that was kind of dingy looking and everything like that, and didn't have the best look out front, didn't have the best look in inside. Said you know what I see potential in it. it has high ceilings, has concrete walls. You know it's in a spot where, um, and the rent was like really doable. Right. So I said all right. Let's 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 do this. Let's go in here. Let's mop it, clean it up, slap on some paint, mm -hmm. get a little bit of equipment in get here, your hands and dirty a little bit. yeah, get your hands dirty a little bit. And of course, like the first thing I did was run a boot camp, right? You know, and the boot camp helped really fuel the fire because one, it got the attention to letting people know where I was and what I was doing, and then secondly, it also generated income I needed in order to build up the studio itself right because uh, you expanded to 2000 yeah you took the next door so door. after about after i had been in so these so this storefront or warehouse space was you know just one 1000 square foot long almost like a i don't want to say a hallway but you know it's a long thousand square foot like rectangular shape right and there's a building right next to it and the guy that owned the warehouse next to mine, who had like a t-shirt company or something, was going out of business. And the whole thing was the, my landlord said, hey, would you like this space that's next door to you? Because um, I had talked to them 
saying that, hey, I'm not going to be here for too much longer because I'm probably going to look for a bigger space. So they said, would you like the space that's next to you? I said, well, it's cool, but why would I have two separate buildings? And my, the owners t- said to me, no, you can actually blow out, you know, well, if you take both spaces, we'll let you blow out a hole through the wall to connect the two spaces. Right. So you can start off small. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with starting off small. So you start off with like 400 square feet. Then, then grew to a th- uh, yeah. grew to a thousand, and then blew out a hole in the wall. Took over two buildings, two thousand square feet. Yeah. So stop thinking that you need to start off with like a ten thousand man. People, they're all the time they're like, I want to have a fifty thousand yeah, square right. foot complex. That's the quickest way to end up broke. See, the whole thing is people got to keep in mind that the best way to get running is by starting off, you know, one foot in front of the other. Right. You know, you, you don't just hit the ground running like as the as the saying goes. You know, you've got to start off one step at a time, put one foot in front of the other before, you know, you're picking up pace and, you know, you're off, you're off to the races. Right. Right. Before we end, I would want to know, uh, do you have a mantra or do you have any kind of like quote that keeps you going, keeps you motivated or that you tell your clients to keep them motivated or to keep them going? Oh, just one. Wow. Anyone. Whew, that's that's hard. Um, honestly, there's no one thing. You know, that's the thing. Is that 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 that's 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 the one thing I find with anything. That there's no one thing. Right. Um, but if there's anything I would have to say that's the D one thing, mm-hmm. and this was with anything in life, is consistency. Yeah. Regardless of what you're trying to get in shape, if you're trying to get rich, if you're trying to you know, uh, build a better relationship, it, you know, consistency is key. You know, um, if let's say with work, you know, show up on time, show up neat, you know, um, be professional, um, keep a high standard and don't just do it on Monday and then ease up on Friday. Right. It's got to be consistent. Do it, you know, you know, um, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you know, you dig your feet in like so yeah. many trainers, like, they, they, they say, all right, I want to be successful. So they give it a hard shot for like a month. And then they're like, nah. And then they go back like a month later. Yeah, it's and the they, same thing with clients. They come in January, fire it up. I'm going to be in the gym four or five days a week. Right. Come May, three days a week. Come <laughs> June, two days a week. August, I'm on vacation. Right, exactly. I'll start again in January. Right. So consistency in any aspect of life for success is key. Yeah. It's absolute key, you know, and that, and mind you, it has to be the right type of consistency because if you're consistently sucking, it's just as bad, as, right. you know, it's not it's not it's not going to help you out. You got to be consistently good at what you do, like regardless of whatever it is, whatever your habits are, you want to be good and consistent with your habits. True, true. All right. Well, um, guys, I I think we're going to cut this here for now. There's a lot that we said that we were going to talk about that we didn't talk about because we just had so much information that we had to, we kind of had to get deep. So that's the thing, you know, consistency is key. If you, if you stay on it, like it might not happen in the first month or the second month, but if you stay on this, if you really want to be successful, you can, you just got to work at it. So, um, so that's about it. Hey, listen, um, I was very lucky to be in a situation where I had great mentors like Schubert. Schubert was very lucky to be in a situation where he had great mentors in New York Sports Club. And listen, if you might, if you have a gym that isn't necessarily the most conducive to learning, I always say, if you're looking for a community of trainers to communicate with, the Dumbbell Sadars course is going to offer you a great opportunity to connect with other trainers that are like-minded, that want to see success. So if you want that extra help, I definitely recommend that you go to dumbbellsdollars.com. Um, check out the course because I know it'll be helpful for you. I'm very active on our private Facebook page to so make sure that you learn what you got to know. But um, that's about it. Uh, thank you for watching. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, put them in the comment section below. I'll be back soon with another uh, Driving with Jonathan video. As long as you remember to eat healthy, hydrate, drive safe. So that's all. Get rest. Don't stop anybody. Love your clients. I love you back. I'll see y'all tomorrow or the next day. And you have a good one.